Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the key themes that Rainer Maria Rilke stresses over and over again in his letters to a young poet is not something that is just applicable to younger people, those who are in childhood or adolescence, young adulthood. It, it really is for all of us, it spans the entire time of our lives up into the very end. And that is that we need to develop patience, that some things can in fact be forced or ordered or compelled to appear at this particular time. Think about your, your calendar, for example. There's some things that you can put on the calendar. You can arrange that this will happen at this time. But when it comes to so many other things in our life, particularly those things that matter the most, they don't work on a timetable. Even those things that, that matter perhaps a bit less and can be broken down into discrete tasks, they almost invariably take longer than you a lot for them as you're scheduling them. And when it comes to things like love or emotions or understanding what it is to be a human being, there, there isn't any schedule on which you can work these things out. You can't break them down into subtasks with benchmarks and put them into software to track your task management or anything like that. As a matter of fact, that would be antithetical to, to doing something along those lines. So, you know, what is really important to us? The development of a friendship, for example, the understanding of a philosophical concept. It, it can't be forced. It takes its own time. There are ideas that I'll just talk about my own experience, then I'll talk about that of my students. There are ideas in existentialist thought that I thought that I fully understood back when I was in my teens or my 20s. And it was only in my 40s that I realized what the author was actually talking about and how superficial and off base my understanding had been and how to get myself from that point over to where the author was, was going and what sort of journey I might need to take along the way. That, that's the sort of thing that you can't just get a recipe book for or a set of algorithms or, uh, you know, a bullet pointed set of, of, you know, uh, bits of advice, right? Some listicle or life hacks or anything like that. As a matter of fact, you could say that anything important really can't be turned into a life hack and, and making a, a life hack out of it and adopting that life hack mentality is probably going to stand in the way. Many of my students in the 20 years that I've been teaching have talked to me about, you know, what they understood of a concept or an experience or a distinction early on in studying it, and then what they really understood it to be much later on. Sometimes they email me long after the, they've finished their official academic studies and say, ah, I finally get what this point in ethics was. So we really have to have patience. We need to exercise a sort of attitude of awaiting or carrying out a, a vigil not just a, you know, putting it to the side and saying, all right, I'll, that'll take care of itself. I'll think about that later. But being open, being receptive, waiting for something to blossom, to unfold, to grow into what it is that it's supposed to be within ourselves, within our own minds and experience. And um, there's, there's quite a few places 
in the letters where, where there's some really interesting advice that's being given. In, in the third letter, he talks about judgments. And I think this is a, a very important point that many people, particularly in philosophy and in other fields, often miss. What do we mean by, by a judgment? Some sort of you know, statement that we make saying, well, this is the case, or this isn't the case, or this is connected to this, or this has certain values, and this uh, doesn't have value, or this is more valuable than that. All of those things are, are judgments. We are the judges. We are the critic, uh, to use the Greek term, right? Krites. Uh, we are the one who is saying, this is, this is so. And many of the judgments that we make can be off base. And we don't always have arguments that everybody could look at and say, aha, you made a logical error right here as, as our basis for the judgments. As a matter of fact, when it comes to most important things, it's not a process of argumentation alone or even primarily that leads us to saying, oh, yeah, here's, here's how things actually stand. So judgments are things that have to develop over time. We actually do a disservice in making people make their judgments much earlier in processes than they ought to. So he says, he's talking about art and making judgments about art. He says, always trust yourself and your own feeling as opposed to argument, discussions, or introductions of that sort. If it turns out that you're wrong, the natural growth of your inner life will eventually guide you to other insights. It won't be the natural growth of just acquiring more information by looking up Wikipedia articles or things like that. It will be you in a back and forth interaction with more information and more experience and probably talking to other people who know something about these matters that will eventually lead you to say, oh, I understand it better now. Now I'm actually equipped to, to make a judgment. That is growth. So he says, allow your judgments their own silent, undisturbed development, which like all progress must, must come from deep within and cannot be forced or hastened. Everything, Rilke says, is gestation and then birthing to let each impression and each embryo of a feeling come to completion entirely in itself, in the dark, in the unsayable, in the unconscious, beyond the reach of one's own understanding, and then with deep humility and patience to wait for the hour when a new clarity is born. This alone is what it means to live as an artist, understanding as is creating. So is he only talking about the arts here? No, he's also talking about philosophy. He's also talking about making judgments about uh, where to put the, you know, the new furniture that you bought, although hopefully that doesn't take you quite so long. He's talking about uh, psychology and understanding human personal relationships. He's talking about a vast variety of things. He's saying it's okay to allow your judgment to slowly develop and the elements of your judgment or the evidences to slowly develop as well and to not have to like oversee the entire process, understanding every single thing, categorizing every single thing. It's okay to let it grow. This is very different than how we typically do education, isn't it? Where we, you know, have a timetable for how everything should happen. And we often demand that the students provide clarity and evidence of every single step along the way. Um, that might be a problem. And it could be that there are some things, for example, coding, where this doesn't really apply to that. Although, you know, insights about how to solve a problem, maybe it does apply to that. Uh, but there's other, you know, wide range of things where this probably does apply. He's got another really wonderful discussion about questions and answers in letter four. And this is really quite brilliant. This can apply not just to young people, as I pointed out, but to all of us. He says that you have to have patience with everything unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. So you have to love the questions without knowing fully what they are. This requires a certain sort of faith, a certain sort of trust, doesn't it? And this is very important, loving the questions like that. He says, don't search for the answers. 
No, that's not saying don't search for them ever. Don't search for the answers. Why not? Which could not be given to you now. Not, not that they couldn't actually be given. Somebody can write them down and hand them to you. Why can't they be given? Because you would not be able to live them. So he says, the point is to live everything. Right now, live the questions. Live within the ambiguity of not having an answer. And eventually, when an answer comes, you'll actually be in such a condition when you can receive it. He says, perhaps then someday far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. Perhaps you carry within you the possibility of creating and forming uh, as an especially blessed and pure way of living. Train yourself for that, but take whatever comes with great trust. Take it upon yourself and don't reject or hate anything. This is probably a, a great a, a bit of advice. Not everything that is puzzling us has to be resolved right now. A family member dies. That doesn't mean that you need to know what death is a month from now so that you can get over it and move on. Death may be an open question. You fall in love. If, if you weren't confused the first couple times you fell in love, and if you didn't remain confused later on in your life when you fell in love, you probably didn't fall in love. Love itself is a question that leads us to an answer. Your vocation is an ongoing question, is it not? So this is the advice that he gives Kappas. Um, when it comes to love, he talks about this in letter 7, um, and he has a lot of interesting things to say. One of the things that he tells us is that, he says, whoever looks seriously will find that neither for death, which is difficult, nor for difficult love, has any clarification, any solution, any hint of a path been perceived. And for both of these tasks, which we carry wrapped up and hand on without opening, there is no general agreed upon rule that can be discovered. Does that mean that we're totally at a loss? Nobody knows anything about love or death or birth or any of the existentials, as we, we might call them. No, it means that we actually have a, a world in which people are constantly giving us all sorts of answers. Think of all the songs out there about love that you could draw upon and you know, try to use as a template for how to run your life. How do you know that any of them are useful at all? You respond to them emotionally and you're like, yeah, man, that describes me. I'm in that situation. The song only goes on for three and a half minutes if it's a pop song. <laughs> Is that actually going to tell you how to live beyond those three and a half minutes? Or what to do the next day? Or how to live week to week to week with that person? It doesn't tell you anything. We don't have answers that can be used as complete blueprints. We have to figure it out ourselves. We have to be patient. We have to sometimes experiment, take action, see how things go. We have to communicate with the other person as best as we can, hoping that they can actually understand us. That is how we, we have to carry on these sorts of things. Um, a little bit later in, in letter eight, he also talks about sadness and he brings up anxiety as well. Um, he says that, that, um, Sadness and anxiety are, are times when the future is entering into us and we have to allow things to grow within us. He says it's important to be solitary and attentive when one is sad because the seemingly uneventful and motionless moment when our future steps into us is so much closer to life than that other loud and accidental point of time when it happens to us as if from outside. The quieter we are, the more patient and open we are in our sadness the more deeply and serenely the new presence can enter us, the more we can make it our own, the more it becomes our fate. And later on, when it happens, that is, steps forth out of us to other people, we will feel related and close to it in our innermost being. So this is, this is what he's, he's saying. Um, when it comes to sadness, when it comes to anxiety, we might think about other, you know, what we call negative emotions as being opportunities for us to exercise some patience and look attentively at what we're feeling and what it's connected to and think about not how to solve it and dispel it and make it go away, 
But what it means to us, what it reveals to us, what it opens up for us, what future it holds for us. Finally, I'm, I'm going to end by bringing up uh, Rilke's very last letter to Mr. Kappas. He talks about solitude, and solitude is one of the most central concepts of the letters to a young poet and Rilke's work in general. Solitude is what's needed. Solitude, Einsamkeit, being on your own, uh, developing this, this inner space uh, that's needed for, for exercising patience and, and letting the time and growth pass on. So he talks about Coppice being in this, this place, and he says, It must be immense, this silence in which sounds and movements have room, and if one thinks that along with all this the presence of the distant sea also resounds, perhaps as the innermost note in this prehistoric harmony, then one can only wish that you are trustingly and patiently letting the magnificent solitude work upon you, this solitude which can no longer be erased from your life, which in everything that is in store for you to experience and to do will act as an anonymous influence, continuously and gently decisive. So that's another key aspect of this. If we develop solitude, we'll be better able to the exhibit to, to actuate this patience that then allows things to grow, which then we can be part of and welcome.